Hi, Founder fans. Jason here. Welcome to Founder of the Day. Today, we are counting down the 13 most underappreciated American founders from the great state of Massachusetts. Now, these American revolutionaries are often overlooked. They're not the most important. Alex, thank you for coming back. Sorry, I messed that up. Anyway, uh, they're not the necessarily most important founders. We're not going to see John Adams on this list. Uh, we won't see Sam Adams. John Hancock is appropriately appreciated, but uh, we are going to see uh, the, the, as I said, underappreciated American founders. So uh, without further ado, uh, as long as everything's working here. Yes. Okay. YouTube gave me some trouble for a second. That's what happens seemingly every time we go live. So we are going to be looking, as I said, at underappreciated founders from Massachusetts. So I'm going to pop up this screen and this time it will work. We're counting down, starting with number 13, James Warren. Now, James Warren was an important leader of Massachusetts uh, during the colonial times, and he continued to re and remained an important leader as the revolution unfolded. He was a distant relative of uh, uh Dr. Joseph Warren, who should have made this list, but I know some people, friends of mine, will be upset that Warren is jo Joseph Warren is not on this list, but Joseph Warren has seen a huge surge in popularity over the last few years in American revolutionary circles. So he's actually, at this point, from my perspective, pretty much appreciated just right. Uh, I, I, I know uh, Spencer Van Herrick, for example, portrays him and Christian Despina. Uh, has written a very good book about him. There's several books that actually recently came out about Dr. Joseph Warren. James Warren is a distant cousin of his who's actually most famous uh, for being married to Mercy Otis Warren, one of the most famous female authors of the time. That being said, when Dr. Joseph Warren is killed at the Battle of Bunker Hill, James Warren takes over the provincial assembly that was heading the revolutionary government of Massachusetts during the revolution. And therefore, uh, he essentially acts as de facto governor of Massachusetts uh, through 1780, the first half or most of the Revolutionary War itself. So we'll move through these first few people pretty quick. Now, this next one's going to be definitely controversial. Hi, Nick. Thank you for coming. Dr. Benjamin Church. Now, Church is controversial because he ends up committing treason. But he was extremely important to Massachusetts leading up to the revolution. One of the physicians in Boston who was respected by pretty much everyone. He was an early member of the Sons of Liberty. <laughs> oh, I'm getting a big reaction from this one. An early member of the Sons of Liberty. And once George Washington takes over the Continental Army, Church is really the first um, physician, surgeon general, basically. Uh, he was head, of phys head, phys I forget his exact title, it was something along the lines of head physician and surgeon of the Continental Army. And he helps in the early years when they are forming the Continental Army, he helps to actually create the medical department of the Continental Army. Now, the reason in the comments Nick is not happy with this selection, justifiably so, is Benjamin Church was corresponding with uh, General Gage, who was overseeing the uh, military dictatorship controlling Massachusetts at the time. Now, uh, interestingly enough, he sends correspondence through his mistress, and his mistress was also mistress to another gentleman who was a British, uh, more associated with the British, uh, who... I'm sorry, no, 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 who was an American patriot. Ooh, didn't mean to slander that guy. Uh, and this patriot sees his mistress carrying Benjamin Church's correspondence and brings it back to the Continental Army. And Church is actually uh, the, the first person that I'm aware of in the Continental Army who was accused of treason and essentially convicted of it, uh, though he does run to the other lines. Now, I am seeing a question from Alex. Is he related to Angelica Church? Uh, uh, no. So Angelica... Church is Angelica Schuyler from the Hamilton uh, musical fame, and Angelica Church married uh, John Barker Church, who was actually an Englishman. They were all Englishmen before the war broke out, but uh, she was he was an Englishman uh, that Angelica Church married. Did they have some distant relative from eons back over in England? Uh, with the shared the name probably but their relationship is is less than negligible 
but that is a great question. Thank you so much for answering. Uh, Bar Benjamin Church, despite his treason, was extremely important to the beginnings of the war, and that's why he's underappreciated. And he committed treason, which was a shot in the stomach for George Washington in the first few months after he took over the Continental Army. So it's it's no small part of the revolution, whether it's a good part or a bad part, much like you know Benedict Arnold, for example. Next up, we have Isaiah Thomas. So Isaiah Thomas was a printer in Massachusetts, a Boston printer, if you will. Uh, most famous for his publication, The Massachusetts Spy, which was a pro-rebel, not necessarily revolutionary, but very critical paper of what was happening in Parliament leading up to the Revolutionary War. He printed many engravings, including some of uh, Paul Revere's engravings. He also uh, submitted many uh uh well what's the word i'm looking for uh um he he was involved with several other papers throughout his career also uh not a lot to say on him it's just the weight of importance that the papers he published carried leading up to the american revolution i really did want to point out moving up to number 10 Nathan Dane. So Nathan Dane is a fun one. He served in the Continental Congress for a while. I believe he signed the Articles of Confederation, though don't quote me on that. He was, um, he did serve in the Continental Congress, an important leader of Massachusetts. He ends up serving in the early federal government, and what he's really important for is he ends up writing a series of law books. Um, actually, before that, he convinces during the ratification debates leading up to the Constitution, Nathan Dane uh, contacts his friend in New York, Melanchthon Smith, who was the leading anti-federalist at the ratification debates in New York, and he essentially convinces Melanchthon Smith to change his opinion on the floor of the ratification debates, uh, swing over and support the uh, ratification of the Constitution, because at that point, since Massachusetts, uh, New Hampshire had ratified, and the Constitution was, in fact, in effect. Uh, Dane convinced Smith that it would be easier to ratify the Constitution and make changes from the inside, as opposed to New York simply joining Rhode Island and North Carolina in fighting against all the other states that had come together. Dane, later in his career, he, he essentially helps create Harvard's law school. Harvard had been around for a long time, but he essentially creates Harvard's law school, and then he writes a multi-volume series of legal papers that becomes the set of legal papers for students and active lawyers in the several decades after the American Revolution. Uh, leading up to and during the Revolution, it was William Blackstone, an Englishman who had written a common law, uh, not dictionary, but work, multi-volume work on the laws of England. And those common laws, for a large part, did carry over to America. But it was Dane's work that gave America essentially its own legal framework, as and by which I mean uh, a text with which students could study law from an American perspective under the American Constitution and the separate state constitutions. Uh, it its effect on Dane's effect on the laws. The understanding of and prosecuting of laws in the United States uh, is extremely hard to understate. With that, we're going to move to another pre-revolutionary no-known image, Joseph Hawley. So Joseph Hawley, I actually made a video about a few weeks ago. He's one of those people who gets no play in the study of the American Revolution, despite his really important role. Uh, many people know that Sam Adams and, and John Adams were largely inspired to their revolutionary ways from James Otis, another founder who's fairly popular and therefore doesn't quite make this list, even though I really strongly considered it. Um, James Otis being the one famous for saying no taxation without representation, getting the Stamp Act, Congress together, all that. Joseph Hawley was an influence even on James Otis and an influence on... Samuel Adams and and a uh, man, I'm losing my words today. Can't get things out. Uh, for uh, John Adams, a mentor to John Adams when it came to legal studies. Not necessarily John Adams didn't study directly under Hawley, but he was a mentor to Adams. In fact, Hawley was a leader of the Sons of Liberty. Once the revolution starts getting going, he is one of the people who chooses the delegates to go to the first Continental Congress. 
for representing Massachusetts. He was considered to go, but he was uh, un... The word is inoculated against smallpox as opposed to John Adams who was. And John Adams was chosen in his place on Hawley's recommendation. So Hawley sends John Adams on his way. He writes something called the Broken Hints Letter, which essentially outlines for John Adams what should be expected at the First Continental Congress. And he actually calls for the unification of all the colonies. He says that we should start concerning ourselves with an army. And this is in the summer of 1774, when the war wouldn't break out until all the way until the following April, when people start following his advice. And he also alludes to the need for a government of all the separate states. Uh, this is a decade and a half before the Constitutional Convention, but really foreshadows the Constitutional Convention. Now, to be fair, uh, to be fair, he did not... Uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin and his Albany Conference about 20 years before that had already kind of recommended this same style government. So it wasn't like he was a visionary in that fashion, but he was prepared for a new government to unite. Now I do uh, see if, before we move on to, oh, also unfortunately for Joseph Hawley, he suffers a little bit of ill mental health uh, and he f totally within two years, by the time independence is declared, goes from being a leader of the revolution to not any part of the revolution. So, uh, with that, uh, we are live. For anyone watching in the future, I see some people joining us, asking some questions. Uh, Dan, thank you for coming. Uh, is Joseph Warren on this list? So I had already discussed Joseph Warren a little bit ago when I talked about his distant cousin, James Warren, who took over the Provincial Congress after Joseph Warren passed away. Joseph Warren is not on this list, and I, I will give you my explanation again. You're not going to see John Adams on this list or Sam Adams. Uh, these are uh, I'm focusing on underappreciated founders, and... Uh, Joseph Warren was underappreciated absolutely forever until the last few years when he's gotten, you know, Christian Despinier wrote a great book on him. Uh, Spencer Van Herrick, as I mentioned, a friend of the show, uh, is a portrayer of Joseph Warren. So Joseph Warren at this point in revolutionary circles actually does uh, get more recognition than he used to. Maybe not enough, but a good amount. So no, unfortunately, Dr. Joseph doesn't make this list. If you want to bail on the show, I understand. But I will let you know who is on this list. Artemis Ward. Number eight. Artemis Ward is a name you might recognize, but he was a soldier and a wealthy person of Boston who, during the French and Indian War, really made a name for himself as a soldier. He is a leader in the militia through the 1760s, and once the Revolutionary War starts approaching and war kind of breaks out at Lexington and Concord, Artemis Ward is the de facto leader of the Massachusetts uh, militia. And therefore, once New Hampshire comes and... Connecticut and Rhode Island, and they all show up and unite together, they realize they're in Massachusetts and they default to the Massachusetts militia. And Artemis Ward is technically, or, or not technically, but unofficially the original leader of the Continental Army, often called the Army of Observation. Now, of course, once the Continental Army is actually formed the following June, George Washington is immediately appointed, and he, George Washington, is the original commander of the Continental Army, once it's really established. But once you have this kind of fledgling army that accidentally came together in Massachusetts in April of 1775, Artemis Ward is in charge of that army. Now, Artemis Ward sticks around once they when the Continental Congress decides to put George Washington, a Virginian, a Southerner, in charge of the Continental Army that was almost 100% stationed in and made up of people from New England, uh, they realize they can't just kick Artemis Ward to the side. And he is named the number two, number one major general in the Continental Army two days after they choose George Washington to be commander-in-chief. And he is number two in the Continental Army. Other than George Washington, everyone else has to listen to Artemis Ward. Now, Ward helps Washington assemble the Continental Army over the following months, including going through the Benjamin Church fiasco in the hospital department. He does this really well, and eventually the British evacuate, and the army moves on to New York City. It's at this point that Artemis Ward is put in charge of the Eastern Department, the Eastern Department essentially being New England, uh, and he remains back to more or less control the territory he 
automatically controlled once the war got underway. So, uh, Nick asking what Washington's view on Ward was. Well, I'm getting to that right now. You see, Washington pretty quickly got his inner circle. And while he obviously respected Ward, not only for his prior services, but the actions he took in New England before Washington even got there, Ward never really found himself in Washington's circle. Washington, of course, accepted him because the Continental Army told Was uh, Continental Congress told Washington he had to accept him. And George Washington, for all the things he may or may not have been, was very good at defaulting to public opinion, aka the Continental Congress. So, one of the things he does because he doesn't really necessarily love Ward, they don't see eye to eye on absolutely everything. That's one of the reasons he puts him. Uh, in the uh, he puts Ward in charge of the Eastern Department. So when they go to New York City, Ward stays back, and when they go through New Jersey, Ward's in New England. And they couldn't, they wouldn't have known this at the time, but very little of the rest of the war actually is fought in New England, with the major exception of the Battle of Rhode Island at Newport. That obviously takes place in New England, but there's other than some skirmishes, there's not a whole lot of actual warfare that takes place in those colonies. Ward also suffered from a little bit of ill health, and I forget the exact year, I think it's 1777, uh, but a few years into the war, he ends up resigning his position, and as opposed to most generals who Washington would say, we really need you to stay, he just says, oh, okay, man, I understand, see you later, uh, and Ward goes home. Now, Ward is almost immediately sent to the Continental Congress. He spends a few years in the Continental Congress, uh, returns home to be a major leader in the state of Massachusetts, and then is, after the ratification of the Constitution, he is then elected to the inaugural House of Representatives, which at the time, with only a handful of states, still not including Rhode Island and um, North Carolina, there's only about there's, uh, 33 or so people in the House of Representatives, which I know seems crazy nowadays, uh, with 435. Uh, but he was one of those first people. And, you know, that first Congress does a lot of things that are hard to underrate. Um, they form the Judiciary Act because the Constitution, when it comes to the Justice Department, essentially says, well, leave it up to Congress. It was a major argument of the Anti-Federalists saying, why would the Congress get to choose what happens? Why would, you know, why would the legislative branch have anything to do with the judicial branch? We're not going to go off on that tangent. But they do that and they pass the Bill of Rights, which you are definitely going to talk a little bit more about later. Uh, we get time out here. Country rules are picked, but I think Charles Henry Lee has been mistreated in the general teaching of America. Well, that's a way off topic, uh, Dan, for this particular issue, but uh, we could certainly have another conversation about Charles Lee. Excuse me, a quick sip of water because all the chit chat I'm doing up here. We're going to move right along here to Theophilus Parsons. So, Theophilus Parsons isn't so important for what he did. Uh, he's very important for an organization he began and its fallout in the later years of the George Washington and early years of John Adams presidencies. So in the late 1770s, independence had been declared and the war wasn't won yet, but independence was declared. So these separate states needed some state constitutions. Massachusetts' first constitution, according to Theophilus, was a little too democratic. And he started a group called the Essex Junto. I believe it's pronounced Junto. I'd have trouble with that word. Uh, but the Essex Junto was a group of people, primarily from Essex, Massachusetts, who didn't like that first constitution. They thought it was too democratic and we need to fix it. And they were able to get it voted down. Massachusetts' first attempt at a constitution was not accepted by the people of Massachusetts. Another one was eventually passed in 1780. And we were going to get back to that in a little bit, but that constitution was passed in 1780. But the Essex Junto doesn't really go around. It continues as an important party in Massachusetts state politics until the ratification of the constitution, at which point the Essex Junto becomes essentially the heart of the Federalist Party. Now, Alexander Hamilton was always the heart of the Federalist Party, and the Essex Junto absolutely loved Alexander Hamilton and everything he said. And because of that, he certainly liked them a whole lot. Now, Hamilton eventually leaves the Washington administration and is replaced by people like James McHenry and more importantly, Timothy Pickering, who I mentioned at the beginning, I didn't include in this list, although my heart kind of breaks and I feel like I should have. So maybe next year I'll include Timothy Pickering, who becomes Secretary of State. He ends up, uh, John Adams in a 
and an attempt to demonstrate goodwill to George Washington and the rest of the nation, tries to be unpartial and be like George Washington, which he certainly was not. Adams was a great guy, but no George Washington was he. But he brings in George Washington's cabinet. And this is where Theophilus is really important. He's still more or less the head of the Essex Junto, and the Essex Junto does whatever John a uh, Alexander Hamilton wants, despite the fact that John Adams is president and therefore leader of the Federalist Party, they still listen to Alexander Hamilton. And that includes James McHenry and Timothy Pickering, members of the Exus Junto, who were in Adams's cabinet. Eventually, this comes to a head, and John Adams has to fire these guys because they are undermining him within his cabinet because they are following the orders of the Junto. Now, not so much Parsons, more Alexander Hamilton, uh, but Parsons had created this organization. To follow up, he would later go on uh, in the uh, 1800s to be Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Court. So he would continue for decades to be an important politician at the state level in Massachusetts. Now, I know we're live. I'm going to remind you of what I said at the beginning. I know I, I, I said earlier that we're not going to be talking about many names people recognize because these are underappreciated founders, right? We're not talking about John Adams too much, except in relation to people like Theophilus Parsons, uh, because everyone knows John Adams, and he is given a good amount of credit. Same thing with John Hancock. He's not the biggest founder in the world, but he gets a little bit of credit, and he did a good amount of stuff. It makes it very hard to pop up this next founder. Paul Revere. Now, does that make me sound like a hypocrite? Probably. Everyone knows Paul Revere. He did a midnight ride. The reason Paul Revere is on this list is because his name is famous nowadays, but what he did in a wide variety of areas is totally overlooked. Paul Revere didn't do one ride. Paul Revere did dozens of rides, uh, including the Portsmouth Alarm, where he rode to New Hampshire, to warn them the British were coming several months before he did that at Lexington and Concord, uh, and including a ride from Massachusetts to the First Continental Congress while it was in session in Philadelphia. He rode from Boston to Philadelphia to deliver the Suffolk Resolves written by Joseph Warren. And the Suff there was a lot of confrontation at the First Continental Congress. No one really knew which direction to go in. There were some ideas, but it was kind of aimless. So Paul Revere shows up with the Suffolk Resolves, and that totally changes the direction of the First Continental Congress. Suddenly, okay, we're done here. We're going to boycott. There, this is too, this is, too much is wrong. We're going to start a boycott. We're going to do this, this, and that. We're going to declare our rights. We're going to send it over to Europe. We're not going to play nice anymore. We're going to say this is garbage, and we're done with it. Uh... Additionally, in response to the Suffolk Resolves, Joseph Galloway, who later becomes a loyalist but is at the First Continental Congress, ends up saying, hey, I have a plan, and he, he gives what's called the Galloway Plan, which is very similar to Ben Franklin's plan from 20 years earlier at the Albany Congress, where I'm not going to get too much into the details, but essentially, the colonies will make their own laws, but will have a chief executive who responds to Parliament and the King Primarily, we'll kind of have our own parliament, but we'll still listen to parliament. It was weird. Uh, on top of all this, Paul Revere has an extraordinarily important role in the early Industrial Revolution. It's really important to remember that the American Revolution spans the end of the Age of Enlightenment and the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And in the 1790s, Paul Revere, who had been a silversmith for most of his career, uh, like most artisans at the time, most people who made things were artisans who made things. He, as a silversmith, would make one spoon at a time, make a spoon, make a spoon, uh, make, you know, a buckle for your shoes, th this and that, out of silver. Now, he was very successful because he had a clientele that was very wealthy for the most part, but... Once the 1790s, the Washington administration comes around, they're suddenly, we're hitting the Industrial Revolution. So he has enough money to build a giant forge right in Boston on top of, so he can heat more stuff. He starts working with iron, which is more affordable, so he can make more for more people, more common people who now have a little bit of money coming in because of this new federal government going on, 
uh, additionally, he starts hiring employees. Now, that might not sound like much today because we live in a post-industrialized society. But at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, this was kind of new, especially in an artisan field. He hires these employees. They end up uh, working for him, but they wanted to be considered artisans because that's what it had always been. You had always been apprenticed to an artisan and then became an artisan yourself. Here he is hiring people in who wanted to be apprentices, but that's not the direction the world was going. And he was smart enough to see that. So he did several things to make people feel as employees like they were artisans. He did things like uh, give them flexible hours to work that revolved around their personal time. He gave them um, a good amount of uh, 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 like wages and he structured wages to someone's skill level. So you would be hired at a certain amount of money based on your skill. And if you improved, he would raise your wages. If that sounds familiar, he was very early on this track. Uh, additionally, and this doesn't sound like any job you've had, he gave them plenty of liquor. He let them get hammered on the job. And that was because people who worked for themselves at the time, they could drink all day. As long as you made a spoon, someone would buy it. <laughs> and he did that. Now, even further, when it comes to the Industrial Revolution, Revere would make molds. Now, he wouldn't make exact copies of pieces like you might see in a modern factory, but he would use molds to be able to more quickly produce goods made of iron and to have them similar. So you could buy sets that were almost exactly the same. It would be very difficult for one artisan to do this, but he would train people to do the same task repetitively and therefore make the products look similar on almost every occasion. Lastly, he ends up working very much with copper, and he gets very good at rolling metals, especially rolling copper, which basically means making very thin uh, strips of it. And then this would be sold in various locations. Uh, the Massachusetts State House, I believe, was one of the first places where the roof, the wooden roof, was covered in copper, which would keep the roof for much longer. Uh, there were certain ships that would line themselves with copper to help themselves defend, all from Paul Revere's forge. Furthermore, Paul Revere opens a bell foundry where there are still bells all over the United States that were created by Paul Revere. Now, these were a lot more time consuming and therefore didn't go into a mold. They were a lot more time consuming and therefore made individually. So you're not going to see a bunch of similar Paul Revere bells around the country. You'll see uh, separate ones. Additionally, he made cannons. He just made just a huge variety of products that were used uh, by many people, including the government. He had many government contracts with the federal and state governments, multiple state governments, where he was building them cannons and other things of that nature. Paul Revere is not just one ride. Paul Revere was many things to the Revolutionary War, many things to the totality of what is the American Revolution. You know, if you view this channel for any point in time, you realize that for me, the American Revolution isn't just winning the war. There are several steps in the American Revolution that build the foundation on which the United States of America, as it currently stands, is laid. Paul Revere has a major, major hand in that. I'm going to sip a little more water because how excited I got for Paul Revere. We're going to move on to number five. And guess what? It's a two for two for one. Thomas and William Cushing. Now, I am going to bring up my note here because I made a note because I don't want to confuse them. <laughs> I have a tendency when I'm talking so fast to confuse some siblings sometimes. So Thomas and William Cushing, one of whom has a better image than the other one. I, 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 I don't know why. One of them got his, his portrait in color and the other one did not. So Thomas and William Cushing come from a fairly wealthy family in Massachusetts leading up to the American Revolution. Uh, during the colonial uh, uh, general court, as it was called in Massachusetts, the, the colonial representative government, Th uh, Thomas Willing is one of the leaders of that court. I believe he sits as chair for several years uh, overseeing Massachusetts Colonial Assembly as the revolution starts chugging along. 
It's during this time that he is corresponding with Benjamin Franklin, who was from Pennsylvania, but representing several different colonies over in Europe uh, to the crown, one of which was Massachusetts. So he corresponds with Benjamin Franklin pretty frequently as his state's representative or colony's representative. Thomas ends up uh, getting some letters from Franklin and unleashing the Hutchinson Letters Affair. So the Hutchinson Letters Affair was Thomas Hutchinson, the, at the time, royal governor of Massachusetts, uh, had sent some letters, allegedly, to Europe that Ben Franklin somehow got his hands on. He sends them to Thomas Cushing saying, hey, you need to be aware of this. Please don't print them because I don't want to get in trouble because people know I'm the one who has them. But here you go. Check these out. And the letters were pretty damning. They really made it seem like Thomas Hutchinson wanted to just start a military dictatorship to force the people of Massachusetts to do what they were told. Uh, spoiler alert, when he's replaced by General Gates, that is essentially what happens. Uh, but Thomas didn't want to get Ben Franklin in trouble, but he was instructed by Franklin to show some people in the know what was going on. So he showed some people who were in the Colonial Assembly. One of those people is Sam Adams, not the person to show. Sam Adams ends up going out and, oopsie, leaks the papers, and it causes quite a frenzy at the time. It gets uh, Hutchinson into some trouble, but Ben Franklin is actually called before Parliament to say, uh, what? What? <laughs> uh, Franklin does kind of get out of it for the time being, but not forever. Uh, he and... Uh, as for Thomas, he ends up joining uh, John and Sam Adams over at the First Continental Congress. He's at the First Continental Congress for a while, uh, comes back to Massachusetts, is part of the revolution, but a lower level player in the state government uh, until the 1780s. Once that new constitution, remember how I said that first Massachusetts constitution didn't work out? Well, that second one in 1780 does work out. Thomas becomes lieutenant governor of Massachusetts, and he stays in this position throughout the 1780s, even though there are different people being governor, he continues to win the race for governor and seems to like it. And he has that power, uh, a really important role in the tumultuous 1780s in Massachusetts. Now, William, his brother, follows him up into politics, uh, does his own set of time in the Continental Congress, and then comes back and just about the time that Thomas is becoming a lieutenant governor of Massachusetts, William becomes chief justice of Massachusetts. So these two gentlemen are in two of, I'd say, the three most powerful positions in the Massachusetts state government throughout the 1780s. William actually is the sitting justice once the decision is finally made on slavery in the state of Massachusetts. The argument, and we're going to get into this with another founder coming up, the argument is that the state constitution, which says all men are born free and equal, uh, should be taken literally, and that all men and women in the state of Massachusetts were free and equal, and therefore in Massachusetts, slavery was unconstitutional. And William Cushing is sitting in the chair when the decision is made, yes, if we follow the Constitution of Massachusetts, it says free and equal. And therefore, slavery not only was abolished, but already had been abolished. They just didn't realize it yet. And William Cushing is the one who pushes that theory forward. And from that day on, I believe the final verdict was in 1783, slavery was eliminated in Massachusetts. Furthermore, uh, because he's doing such a good job as Chief Justice of Massachusetts, once George Washington takes over the United States government as president, he does some appointing to some associate justice positions on the United States Supreme Court, and William Cushing is an early member, an inaugural member of the United States Supreme Court, and he sits there for 20 years, the remainder of his life, uh, about half of which is under the uh, uh, John Marshall administration. Although I should say, of the first four chief justices, he is a part of. So, the Cushing brothers, though not necessarily the sexiest role, were extraordinarily important to Massachusetts during the 
before the revolution, during the revolution, after the revolution, and into the federal government. So I gave you two for one, because you can't separate those bro. Can't separate the bros. How dare we? Now, we're, we're getting into the top four right now. The next one, maybe a little high on this list, but I like them, so I put them here. Francis Dana. Francis Dana is a founder we know, uh, many people know very little about. I know, I know a good deal about him. We're going to talk about him. <laughs> I shouldn't, I was going to say we know very little about him. We know about him, and we're going to learn. Uh, Dana, born family, lived in the, or, or served in the, uh, revolutionary government serves in the massachusetts government uh, after independence is declared he is sent to the continental congress and he makes a name for himself in the late 1770s in the continental congress he signs the articles of confederation for his home state and then in 1780 he is chosen to join john adams in a trip to europe and he goes and serves briefly with john adams in paris before the continental congress chooses him to go over and serve in Russia. Now, sometimes we don't connect pieces of history. We know famous names from history, but we don't necessarily put them together. Francis Dana goes to Russia. The person in charge is Catherine the Great. Yeah, that name from your European history books that never really made it into your American history books. That was happening at the same time. Side note, uh, and we will talk about this later. Uh, 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 Frederick the Great was also serving in Prussia at the time. Catherine the Great uh, does not accept Francis. He goes to Russia for three years. But Catherine the Great was nervous about joining, recognizing American independence because she did not want a war with Great Britain. Nor did she want a war with France. Actually, in response to Dana's arrival, she does something totally out of left field. She starts something called the League of Armed Neutrality. The League of Armed Neutrality was a bunch of, we'll call them lesser European nations, who didn't want to get mixed in in any of these wars that were happening. And therefore, they came to agreement that said, we're never going to attack anyone, but we will mutually defend each other. Hey, Britain. Hey, France. If you attack Lithuania, or I don't remember all of the nations that were involved, many of them very small, but if you attack... I think Lithuania, if you attack Lithuania, well, guess what? Russia's coming. Uh, not Sweden. I'm, I'm blanking on several of the very small nations at the time, <laughs> mostly in Eastern Europe, many of whom didn't even have navies because they were landlocked. Uh, if you attack one of us, you're attacking all of us. So stay out. That's the whole point of our league of armed neutrality. We are armed to make sure we stay neutral. Dana, his uh, attempts completely destroyed, <laughs> comes back to North America, serves in the Continental Congress for a brief period before he replaces, and we'll bring him back, William Cushing. William Cushing, who was, uh, at the time, Chief Justice of Massachusetts. He leaves to go join the Continental Congress, and he is replaced by Francis Dana. Now, interestingly enough, Francis Dana serves for about 15, 20 years until he's replaced by Theophilus Parsons. So if you notice, you may notice that many of the people we are discussing today end up being Chief Justice of the state of Massachusetts. Now, take one more sip of water and we're going to get into the top three. Dun, da, da, da. Theodore Sedgwick. Theodore Sedgwick was a young man from Massachusetts, becomes a lawyer, the revolution breaks out, joins the state government, forgive me if you've heard this before, goes to the Continental Congress, lies in the Continental Congress, he comes back. Now, before we were talking about William Cushing, we mentioned freedom uh, and the elimination of slavery in Massachusetts. The person who really gets credit for this is Theodore Sedgwick. So, Theodore Sedgwick, even before the revolution broke out, was uh, uh, at the, the House of... John, I think it's John Ashley. The last name is Ashley. He's at the Ashley House in Sheffield, Massachusetts, close to where he lived. They meet and they have a declaration called the Sheffley Resolves. And the Sheffley Resolves were similar to what was going on kind of in many small towns across the colonies leading up to the revolution. They declared their rights as Englishmen. Don't get, you know, be nice to us, Parliament. 
What's really interesting about the Sheffield Resolve is not only is Theodore Sedgwick a young man there who probably took notes and probably wrote the Resolves, but there's a young woman there who's enslaved whose name is Mombet. Now, Mombet is mistreated by uh, the the Ash Mrs. Ashley. Her first name eludes me. Uh, at the time, in New England in general, and in Massachusetts at large, yes, there was slavery. Uh, most families only owned one slave, and they lived in the house, and were treated essentially, unfortunately, uh, like a child. The same way uh, women were treated, to be honest, uh, like a child. Uh, slavery in New England was very much different than the way it operated in the South. Not to justify it, just to acknowledge it. That being said... Uh, Mumbet was treated poorly, and there were actually laws in Massachusetts that you could be, you know, legally held liable if you did abuse your slave, because at least in Massachusetts, they recognized that slaves were people, legally enslaved people, but people nonetheless. Now, I don't want to get too into controversy here, but what happens is, a few years later, Massachusetts passes that second attempt at a constitution we've been discussing that actually passes in 1780. And shortly thereafter, Mum bets in the town square, and she hears someone reading that new constitution. And she says to herself, all men are free and equal. Really? So she goes to Theodore Sedgwick's house. And she says, Mr. Sedgwick, I understand all people are created free and equal. Now, Theodore here was an early version of what we might call an abolitionist. Actually, when it comes to Massachusetts, he's the abolitionist because he says, yeah, Mumbet, you're absolutely right. And he sues the Ashleys for her freedom or sues the state for her freedom from the Ashleys. Now, the Ashleys do put up a defense because, you know, no one's hands are clean here. And, you know, the slave holders in most of Massachusetts uh, didn't want to simply lose their property without some kind of reimbursement. They, Although the idea of freedom in Massachusetts had been widely taken on as, okay, slavery needs to end. You know, this is in, you know, not long after Phyllis Wheatley is publishing her papers as, as a young black child. The idea of black people being treated as people in New England and Massachusetts in particular, and Portsmouth, New Hampshire, I always like to give a shout out to, very much in particular, uh, it's time had come. And Theodore Sedgwick launches a freedom suit on behalf of Mumbet and several other slaves that over the next three years eventually is brought to the court, the Supreme Court of Massachusetts, where our old friend William Cushing makes the decision, yes, the constitution of this state says that everyone had already been freed a few years ago. Whoops, accidentally freed our slaves, but you know what? Sweet. And Massachusetts, thank you largely to the work of Theodore Sedgwick, eliminates uh, slavery. Additionally, uh, just as for Mumbet, uh, her name, she would change her name to Elizabeth Freeman. And now that she was not a slave, she needed a job and she ends up working for Theodore Sedgwick. He provides her a job. Uh, she works as a nanny for her children and helps educate the children uh, and spends most of the rest of her life living in the Sedgwick household. Actually, uh, there's another uh, a person of color that I anticipate making a video about in the coming days uh, who also ends up working for Theodore Sedgwick. So uh, that's the beginning of his career. <laughs> That's the 1780s. He ends up going on supporting the United States Constitution, uh, is an early member of, I believe an inaugural member of the House of Representatives, spends four sessions, eight years there, ends up replacing someone who had left the United States Senate, so spends a few years in the United States Senate, and then goes back to the House of Representatives for two more years, where he spends that entire time as Speaker of the House of Representatives during the John Adams administration. And we're talking about Massachusetts, so John Adams' name has come up a lot. Sedgwick was admirer of an admirer of John Adams for a very, very long time. They do end up having some disagreements when John Adams is president over a handful of things, uh, but his last day in the House of Representatives is the same as John Adams' last day as president, and he ends up sharing a carriage ride or several carriage rides home from Washington, D.C. that had only recently been occupied by the government back to Massachusetts together. Theodore Sedgwick is, from my perspective, the number three most underappreciated founder from Massachusetts. Quick sip of water here. <sighs> 
And we're going to go on to number two. Drum roll, please. No drum roll. Nathaniel Gorham. Now, if you've watched this channel for any length of time, you will probably know where I'm going with this. Now, Nathaniel Gorham doesn't have the biggest, longest, sexiest story in the whole world, but just like everyone else we've talked about, worked his way up in Massachusetts politics, became a lawyer, goes to the Continental Congress. He actually is a very good politician and is chosen as a president of the Continental Congress during the 1780s. Now, unfortunately, this is during the period of time where things are not going well and not much is happening in the Continental Congress. So before I talk about what makes him a very important American founder, I'm going to talk about something that could have made him the worst American founder. Now, no judgment here, Nathan and Nathaniel, but this is a time where constitutional monarchies were a thing and very, very common. In fact, um, this is a time where there there were what was called enlightened monarchs. Many of the people running the monarchies of Europe considered themselves enlightened. They had constitutional monarchies. One of these people was Frederick the Great. Frederick the Great had unified Prussia and was seen by many Americans as not only enlightened, but in favor of their cause. He had been friendly with Baron von Steuben, who was important to the Americans, when there were Hessian soldiers, there was no unified Germany at this time, but when Hessian mercenaries were trying to travel across Europe to get to England so they could sail across and get paid to destroy the American uprising, Frederick the Great did not let them pass through his territory. They had to go around because he liked what the Americans were doing. They weren't monarchy, but they were pretty close. The reason I bring this up is when Nathaniel Gorham was president of the Continental Congress, a plan was hatched to solve this problem of no one being able to get control of these separate states. And the idea was, hey, maybe, just maybe, we need a king over here. Now, in hindsight, it sounds absolutely ridiculous, but at the time, there were surprisingly high-level patriots who thought this was a good idea. So... As president of the Continental Congress, whose job it was to write and sign correspondence on behalf of the Continental Congress, even when it was unofficial correspondence, Nathaniel Gorham wrote a letter to Frederick the Great's brother, Henry, Prince Henry of Prussia, you know, who later became King Henry of the United States. No, that's not true. Now, we did end up finding a letter, His, his historians found decades later, a letter that verified this was true, of Prince Henry turning the idea down. He said, thank you so much for offering me the position of King of the United States, but I don't think the people of America are ready for it, so I'm going to stay here with my brother because we're doing good things in Prussia. Now, Nathaniel still thought there were some problems here because the Continental Congress wasn't getting the job done. Many people thought this way. That's why they called the Constitutional Convention. And the reason Nathaniel Gorham is so extraordinarily important in American history is he attends the Constitutional Convention representing Massachusetts, and he would sign that document. But famously, George Washington was unanimously and immediately elected as chairman, a.k.a. president, of the Constitutional Convention. Why wouldn't he be? That was the first thing they did, was we got to set some rules here for the convention. Let's get a president. They got George Washington. Shortly thereafter, they decided on a parliamentary procedure called Committee of the Whole. And if you know anything about government, governments form committees. And, okay, we'll get these five people. You go figure out this topic. Come back. Tell us what you think. And we'll work it out from there. Nathaniel Gorham uh, was chairman of the Committee of the Whole. The Committee of the Whole was a committee that was made up of everyone in, co in the convention might not make a lot of sense on the surface, but the point of this is, if you're talking on the floor of the convention, well, your conversation gets written to the record. You can't take that back. But if you're in a committee, you can float ideas and ballpark things. And, you know, if it doesn't work out, you can say, okay, bad idea. Never mind, guys. Don't worry about it. The committee of the whole was everyone floating ideas for this, you know, new government of the United States of America. And Nathaniel Gorham was chosen as 
chairman of the Committee of the Whole. So for the first several months of the Constitutional Convention, almost every day, George Washington would get in his chair, gavel it into session, and then say, okay, let's go into the Committee of the Whole. And he would step down from the chair, and Nathaniel Gorham would take George Washington's place and oversee the most intense, often most important, debates on how to structure the United States Constitution. May not be a lot of story to tell for Nathaniel Gorham, but that little bit that he oversaw the debates of the Committee of the Whole that got heated at times, that he had to choose, okay, we've heard from this senator, from this uh, this representative from this state, we need to go to the delegate from this state who has an opposing view but represents his state. These are, I cannot, I cannot stress it enough how important this man's chairing of the Committee of the Whole led to the creation of the United States Constitution and therefore the United States itself. Nathaniel Gorham. Huge. <laughs> I'm going to take one sip of water before I unveil our next guest. Our next guest. Our next founder. Final founder. Number one. The most underappreciated founder from Massachusetts. Elbridge Gary. Whoa, you say. I thought it was going to be names we didn't recognize. Well, Gary does get a little bit of credit, but as we discussed with Paul Revere, not nearly enough. He's famous for gerrymandering, which is a mispronunciation of his last name, and uh, something he didn't want. We're going to get there in a little bit, but Elbridge Gerry signed the Declaration of Independence as a young man. He was considered by John Adams one of the most fervent advocates of independence and one of the most ardent patriots for the cause early in the war. Uh, he sticks around and signs the Articles of Confederation. He then goes back to Massachusetts because Massachusetts wasn't sending enough troops to the war and he thinks... I can do more work at home for the cause than here in Congress. He ends up being chosen for the state Senate and turns it down because he'd prefer to be in the House, the state House, where he could get more done directly to support the war effort. Now, Gary did think there needed to be more of a central government. And mark my words, he was an elitist. Let's not worry about that. We'll talk about that a little bit in a second. But... Gary ends up being sent to the Constitutional Convention. Hi, Nightmare. Thank you so much for coming. Gary gets to the... That's all right. We're at number one, and this is the most important one out. Thank you guys for coming. So, Gary gets to the... Consti just to recap for you guys, sign the Declaration, sign the Articles, goes to the Constitutional Convention. While he's at the Constitutional Convention, he actually recommends that there be an electoral college-style system for the House of Representatives and the Senate. He really didn't like the idea of the people at large voting for things, but he participates in the creation of the government. He's, he's speaking on the floor of Congress very frequently. He ends up really helping construct the document and then, when they arrive at the day, September 17th, to vote on the article on the United States Constitution, Elbridge Gerry is one of three people to vote no. He voted no. He could have signed that document and therefore been one of the only three people to sign the three major documents of the revolution. But he chooses not to. Now, there are several reasons given for why he votes against this, and I'm not going to get too into it because I do intend to do a video on Elbridge Gerry's anti-federalism coming up. Uh, he ends up writing a letter that gets published and circulated across the colonies arguing against the Constitution. His primary reason is there's no Bill of Rights. He's really, really, really in favor of a Bill of Rights. No Bill of Rights is passed. Uh... <laughs> Uh, he goes home, he argues against the Constitution. He is so fervently against the Constitution, he's actually not elected to the Massachusetts Ratification Convention. 
but he's invited by the leaders of the ratification convention to attend anyway as a guest though he gets in a shouting match with uh someone's name's escaping me it might be francis uh, uh nathan dane nathan dane who we mentioned before i forgot to mention was the chairman of the ratification convention in massachusetts Albert gary gets in a screaming match with him and dane basically says you're a guest here you weren't elected get out <laughs> he does get out and then the constitution is passed now there are only I forget the exact number, but Massachusetts passed the Constitution with a vote of like 187 to 164. There's over 300 people voting, and it only passes by like 20 votes. There's a lot of anti-federalist sentiment, and a lot of people really respect what Gary's saying about a Bill of Rights. So even though he didn't sign the Constitution, he went out and actively fought against it, he is then elected to the United States House of Representatives as an inaugural member. While he's there, he helps James Madison craft the Bill of Rights. He gets on the floor of Congress. As soon as Congress opens, he's the one. Elbridge Gary's the one saying, we need this. We need to do this. We need to take this seriously. Look, Rhode Island, New North Carolina, they won't join the Union until we start talking about it. Uh, all these other states ratified conditionally, even though legally they couldn't put conditions on it. This is what the people want. They want a Bill of Rights. Elbridge Gary helps force the, the conversation on the Bill of Rights. Uh, he's extremely important to the Fourth Amendment against unwarranted search and seizure. He's extremely important about getting freedom of the press in the First Amendment. Uh, and he's extremely important in getting the Tenth Amendment, uh, which is super underrated, that uh, everything else, uh, was uh, anything not delegated to the Congress is left up to the states or the people. He actually lost on a conversation because he wanted the word expressly stated in the Constitution. Uh, and so it would have been a lot more direct. It would have extraordinarily limited the power of the federal government. Though, again, he did want a federal government. That's why he was at the Constitutional Convention. He did want to consolidate. He thought there was a need for the federal government. He just didn't like all that power they gave it. This being said, he serves in the Congress for a while, goes back to Massachusetts when he is chosen by John Adams to serve as a delegation to France in an effort to stave off what becomes the quasi-war with France, John Adams sends a delegation of Elbridge Gerry, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, and John Marshall to France. Now, this becomes the XYZ affair. Essentially, the revolutionary French government says, ah, bribe us! <laughs> and uh, the delegates, the representatives say no. Now, Coatsworth Pinkney, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney and John Marshall end up leaving pretty quickly. Elbridge Gerry hangs around and keeps up conversations with France, trying to work things out, and is more or less the delegate there during the troublesome times of the quasi-war with France. He ends up leaving after that war has been going on for a little bit and comes back uh, to North America. Now, his appointment was always questionable. John Adams was a Federalist, and... Charles Coatsworth Pinckney and John Marshall were Federalists. Elbridge Gerry was nothing. He is one of the only guys, other than George Washington, really, who was unaffiliated with party. Because he would disagree with both parties <laughs> on a lot of occasions and agree with both parties on other occasions. He was extraordinarily one of a kind. Uh, he ends up coming back to America, and he had been ridiculed in the papers by the Federalists. Look, the one federal, the one guy who's not a Federalist we send is over there chit-chatting, being friendly with France. Isn't that garbage? But Gary wasn't a Democratic Republican. He wasn't a Jeffersonian or a Madison who really liked what France was doing. He was there. He didn't, he didn't like it very much at all, but he wanted to keep the lines of conversation open. So even though he had been burned in effigy, he comes back, and after the Quasi-War ends, he publishes his correspondence with Talleyrand, the ministry he was dealing with in France, and totally vindicates himself. And people are like, oh, whoops. <laughs> that being said, they don't necessarily immediately forgive him, and he leaves national politics and goes back to Massachusetts. While he's in Massachusetts, he runs for governor, over and over and over again and continues to lose to the Federalist candidates. Once he had come back uh, and, and the Federalist Party had been slandering so much, he kind of by default falls in line uh, with the Democratic Republicans. He, he ends up having more in common with them. They were a lot nicer to them. 
because much like modern politics today, uh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And if the Federalists are all just talking so much trash about Elbridge Gary, well, he must be a Democratic Republican. And Gary was like, fine. <laughs> He comes, he runs as a Democratic Republican for governor over and over again. Massachusetts, like most of New England, heavily Federalist, keeps losing, keeps losing until uh, 1810. I, I believe it's 1810. He's finally actually elected governor. By this point, the Federalist Party is waning, 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 even in Massachusetts, and Gary's reputation had redeemed itself. Not only that, but more Democratic Republicans were, more people in Massachusetts were becoming Democratic Republicans. He finally is elected governor of Massachusetts. And when he's elected, a bunch of Democratic Republicans are elected, and constitutionally, every so often in Massachusetts state, they had to do redistricting to counter for the population because 1810, it's been 10 years, there's a new federal census, now we know how many people there are, and what happens. Well, the Democratic senators who are suddenly in the majority want to keep their majority, and therefore they do a little redistricting, and they redistrict these lines all over the place, and one of them looks like a salamander. And Elbridge, Jerry, si Elbridge Gary signs the law, and they call that salamander a gerrymander. And that's why today we have the phrase gerrymandering. Now, Elbridge Gary hated this idea. Uh, he didn't use the word disgusting. I forget the exact word he uses, but he didn't like it. He looked at it as dishonest and not what the people wanted. But... It was passed through Congress, and he didn't think it was worth such a fight. Because it's not like Massachusetts was the first place to do this. This had been happening in America, in the colonies, in Europe. This was a long-standing tactic that had happened over and over again. And even though Gary didn't like it, he said, fine, I'll sign it. I'll sign it. Let's just do the redistricting. Get it over with redistricting. is a pain in the butt. And it was the either the worst mistake he ever made or the best. Because... His name is slandered with gerrymandering to this day. They pronounce his name wrong when they say gerrymandering. But at least his name is kind of in the modern lexicon. So at least he's still with us a little bit. Though, in a discussion about underappreciated founders, not for the right reasons and not appreciated for the right stuff. Because, guess what? He's not done yet. He serves for two more years, then again loses to Caleb Strong, who the Federalists pulled out of retirement to become governor again. And a few months later, he gets a, a phone call, bring, bring, they didn't have phones then, but he gets a letter from James Madison, who was running for his second term in office, whose vice president, George Clinton, had just passed away, and says, Elbridge Gary, would you like to run for vice president with the incumbent president? And Elbridge Gary, who 10, 20, almost 30 years beforehand, had refused to sign the United States Constitution, becomes the fifth vice president of the United States of America. He serves for four years. Now, one of the reasons he was chosen is he was a Democratic Republican in the Northeast, would bring in votes from New England that might be uh, on, the, on the waiver wire there. Uh, swing votes, I guess we would call them. And additionally, at a time where vice president wasn't next in line for president, Secretary of State was next in line for president. Jefferson had been Washington Secretary of State. Madison had been Jefferson, Secretary of State, and Monroe was Mon Madison's sitting Secretary of State. James Monroe, for all intents and purposes, was the next in line to be President of the United States. They looked at Elbridge Gerry as a person who would not pose a significant threat in four years later against James Monroe. And that's why Elbridge Gerry primarily was chosen as Vice President of the United States. Now... Of all the things I discussed about Elbridge Gary, I, I, I've been calling him Jerry now because I said gerrymandering and that's what's in my mouth. I I'm understand it's pronounced Gary. Uh, of all the things Gary did, uh, while he was at the Constitutional Convention, he actually argued against including slavery in the federal constitution at all. He spent, a, not a, I don't want to say a good portion of his career, he wasn't Rufus King, <laughs> but he, he did actively argue against slavery on many occasions. Uh, especially at the Constitutional Convention, because that is four years after Theodore Sedgwick had and, and William Cushing had helped eliminate slavery in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, furthermore, Pennsylvania was already seven years after 
eliminating slavery. So he did not think there was any reason to even be including it. Uh, he, I wouldn't call him an abolitionist, but he did think slavery was wrong. He was against slavery throughout the entirety of his career. The reasons he argued against it at the Constitutional Convention, you could primarily argue it was because he didn't want to give too much power to the southern states, uh, though many of his letters and correspondence say it should be eliminated entirely. Not that we should abolish it entirely, but that there is no place for even the mention of slavery in the federal government. And that is that. I guess I'll bring myself back up here. Not that much bigger. Uh, Founder fans, thank you so much for hanging out. This has been a lot of fun for me. A lot of talking. It's only been an hour. Feels like longer than that. I messed up the first video. That's why. <laughs> uh, you guys have any questions or comments? Uh, Al, thank you for the positive uh, feedback. And Nightmare, very horrifying, but thank you for the positive feedback. Not entirely sure how you get your... Uh, your font to be that style you should let you should let us know i would love to learn how to do that alex flynn uh alex flynn thank you for the comments we absolutely can get over new yorkers i actually was gonna start with new hampshire because the american founders uh, when they signed documents and when they had votes they went north to south don't know why that's just how they always did it so i was gonna start with new hampshire and work my way down uh but Massachusetts had so many fun people. New Hampshire, I found, too, is like pretty much everyone other than a few generals in the war are underappreciated. Uh, uh, jo John Stark is pretty much the only guy who gets to play. Maybe John Sullivan. Uh, we can definitely move to New York next uh, if you want. Thank you for the recommendation. I will also say, uh, if you guys do enjoy the channel, I put out a few clips throughout the week of most of the important content. But if you want to support the channel over on Patreon, I do a live video on sunday nights at seven where uh it's more of a q a you guys can talk to me about stuff and i also uh have a little bit lengthier stuff most of the content i put clips out online as you've seen uh, i did uh what's his name this week uh you williamson whose story was a lot of fun if you didn't see that definitely check out that video uh but like i said you want to support the channel really love help offset some of the costs don't anticipate making any money but maybe bringing my costs down closer to zero would be beneficial so thank you for your support thank you to all the patriots on patreon who are already supporting this channel you guys mean the world to me uh you all mean the world to me that's what you know this is a good time we're having fun here uh you know what i can put some time into new yorkers i will say massachusetts took me a lot longer than i anticipated that's why i scheduled this for 7 uh uh 8 45 and went live at like 9 15 because it took a while uh to copy and paste pictures basically and type their name in uh so i'll get more of a head start for next time we can bounce to new york next time new york is fun because most of its important founders I, I feel like are overlooked you know hamilton obviously not though not really from new york uh that's why the constitution says and mr hamilton from new york because the other guys bounced uh, but yeah, we could definitely do New York. That would be a fun one. Virginia will probably be a lot of fun. There's a lot of, a lot of famous Virginia probably has the most recognizable founders. So that'll be a state that's fun to find some people from, uh, same with Pennsylvania. So look forward to that. Thank you for the recommendation, Alex. I sure appreciate the feedback. With that being said, unless there's any more questions, comments, or concerns, I am going to take off. I am getting tired of all this talking. Although I do enjoy it. I will be back with you guys uh, sooner rather than later. And I am your humble and obedient servant. I, I, I don't know how to sign off anymore. I, I changed my sign off and I need a better sign off. So my name is Jason. I am your humble and obedient servant. Let me know if you like that one. Let, let me know if you like it.